He's saying we're not ready yet. Okay. All right. So thank you guys for coming back for week three. We're going to be covering letters and gospel. Those are the two genres that we're going to cover today. Um, so I just want to encourage you guys. I know that this has been a lot of material. Um, I just want you guys to not put any pressure on yourselves to, to realize that this is going to be something that I don't expect you to just come here once, listen, and just know it, right? <laughs> Certainly doesn't work that way for me, at least. Uh, this is something, this, this resource, I'm hoping that is something you'll keep, and the YouTube links and all that, and when you're studying these genres, you can go back to the video and use them as a reference to kind of, you know, if you're dealing with a problem passage or a different interpretation from a different denomination or something like that, these things can kind of help us uh, remember the basics of interpreting. So again, I just want to encourage you guys, I know it's a lot of information. I know it's like drinking from a fire hydrant, and it's supposed to be that way. I just want to expose you kind of to the material, and just so you can see what's out there, and then you can kind of pick what you want to use as a launch pad to go from there. So let's go ahead and get into letters. So 35% of the New Testament, there we go, 35% of the New Testament is comprised of letters, so a pretty good chunk. And uh, when you're looking at, here's like the chart above here. This is a list of the New Testament uh, letters listed underneath the authors that uh, are typically credited for writing the letter. So you can see Paul, the first one there, has quite the monopoly, <laughs> right? And that was because a lot of it was because of him being in prison. He had a lot of time to write. So how are these letters, how do they compare to ancient letters of that time period? Well, there are some informal, informal letters that were a routine part of everyday life that were meant to be uh, read only by the person to whom they were addressed. Some of these uh, you know, examples of informal letters in the ancient times were business contracts, civic records, letters between family members or friends. Some examples of the New Testament of letters that fit this is uh, Philemon, Second John, and uh, Third John. Then you also have, and when we're looking at ancient letters, you have formal letters, which were more artistic literary letters designed for public presentation. And these would be like some examples of New Testament formal letters would be like Romans, Ephesians, Hebrews, James. So I also wanted to note that New Testament letters are a lot longer than a lot of the letters we have uh, from the biblical time period. So like from the 14,000 or so letters that we have from the Greco-Roman period, or Greco-Roman period, the average length is about 87 words. It's a pretty short letter, right? Uh, even when you look at some of like Cicero and Seneca's who, who wrote longer letters, they average to be at like 995. Okay, but Paul, <laughs> Paul's letters averaged 2,495. That's, those are, that's a big, big jump, right? His longest was 7,000 something. So the added length of these letters makes sense because when we consider how much space it took in a letter for these early Christian leaders to conduct their missionary work and shepherd their flocks uh, from a distance, right? They needed room to be able to say hello and goodbye and bring their readers up to date, encourage and instruct, uh, tackle difficult issues, warn against false teachers, and much more. So when you factor in those things, it makes sense that their letters are a lot longer. I'm not going to get it too much into this, but here are some various types of letters we find in the New Testament. There's diatribe, which is like a series of question and answer type of format. There's apologetic letters of, uh, of self-commendation uh, and paranesis or exhortation. So you can look those up if you're more interested in those, but those aren't, that's not very significant. So these letters provided a way for these early Christian leaders to express their views and minister from a distance. So original, the original audience would have viewed Paul's letters or Peter's, for example, as substitutes for the apostles themselves. However, not just like personal substitutes, they were authoritative substitutes. So they would have taken the authority of that, of who's ever in that congregation, they would have taken that authority. And we kind of see that when Paul uh, writes in some of these, sorry, my clicker's not clicking the best. Yeah, it might have to. Maybe your battery's low or something. Yeah, you can try that. But uh, yeah, just go ahead and go to that next slide. So in Galatians 1.1, 1, 1, we get an example of this, of Paul, an apostle. Uh, he he kind of uh, announces this, right, at the beginning of Galatians. And there's an example of that where he says, Paul, an apostle, sent not for men nor by uh, man, but by Jesus Christ and the and God the Father who raised him from the dead. There's a second one from Peter. So by stating the apostleship at the opening of the letter, the author assumed the place of authority in that community. Okay, 
uh, next slide. So another fourth characteristic uh, of New Testament letters is that they're situational. This is really, really important to consider. Um, and this has really changed a lot of, even in, my, in the later years of my life, uh, just how important it is to view these letters as situational in a lot of circumstances. So uh, when you think about it, these letters were written to specific problems or situations related to the author to the readers. So they usually wrote these letters to either clarify an issue, to address a doctrinal problem, or to confront the readers about their behavior. Cool, it's working now. So, uh, no, I don't want to go to that just yet. So these letters were never meant to be exhaustive dictionaries of Christian theology, right? Uh, and uh, they actually used theology to, they used it differently. Instead of giving like a big list of theology, they could have wrote books on theology, right? They instead applied that theology uh, in applications and how they wrote to the churches. So Stuart and Fee conclude it pretty good by saying this. One will go to the epistles again and again for Christian theology. They are loaded with it. But one must always keep in mind that they were not primarily written to expound Christian theology. It is always theology applied to or directed towards a particular need. So as a result, when interpreting New Testament letters, we have to be careful not to conclude too much from one letter. Paul's letter to the uh, Galatians emphasizes freedom in Christ for the church struggling with legalism. In 1 Corinthians, however, he stresses obedience for the church that is taking its freedom to immoral extremes. Neither letter by itself represents Paul's entire teaching on freedom or obedience, right? Both letters offer a corrective message tailored to the circumstances of those specific churches. So we know from all of Paul's letters that he endorses both freedom and obedience, right? But he emphasizes freedom to the Galatians because they're struggling with that and obedience to the first Corinthians in order to correct the church headed in the wrong direction. So if we fail to see these letters as situational or occasional, uh, we can easily misinterpret them. Uh, so you can obviously see how it's really important that we need to reconstruct the original occasion, right, to be able to understand these letters. Uh, but that's, that can be difficult, right? I mean, what was Paul talking about when he wrote Thessalonica or, or, or wrote the letters to uh, the church in Philippi? Uh, knowing the original situation will help us when it comes to identifying the theological principle that we're after. So, and this is not as easy as it seems. It can be a little bit difficult, and that's because uh, it's kind of like listening in on, on a phone, on a telephone with only hearing one side of the conversation, right? Because we have the letters, which is the response to the church, but we don't have what the church sent Paul or what the other half of the conversation. So, but even though we don't have that, there are still really easy ways that we can kind of construct that original situation. Not all is lost. So when we think of Paul writing a letter or an apostle writing a letter, this is kind of what we think of, right? This picture comes to mind. And this is a great example of what we uh, talked about last week about interpretational reflex, right? Where we take the biblical world and immediately just transport it into our world without thinking about it. This artist who made this, he was, uh, I can't remember his name, but it was in 1620. So when he was thinking about Paul writing his letters, he's thinking from a 16, how people wrote letters in 1620, which was a lot like this, right? But that's not how letter writing uh, was done back in the day, uh, back in his time period. So they were carefully written and delivered. This task of actually writing down the letter was normally given to a trained scribe, or a, which was also known as a, um, I always say this wrong, but amanuensis is how you say it, amanuensis. And uh, so some examples of this where, where the, the amanuensis is, is referred to in the letter is like Romans 6.22 where it says, I, Tertius, who wrote down this letter, greet you in, in the Lord. Uh, so this doesn't mean that Tertius was the author of Romans, but served as Paul's secretary in, in his stead. So some secretaries were given more freedom, some not. Uh, but either case, it doesn't really matter. The author, not the secretary, was responsible for the final contents of the letter. Now, that second and third scripture down there at the bottom, these are some other examples of, of the author's final greeting, which it was common for the author to usually write it in his own hand. The very end of the letter, he'd write, you know, I, Paul, write this to you or whatever. So that's kind of was normal back then as well. So they were carefully written and delivered, and Paul used co-senders to assist him in the drafting, editing, and rewriting of the letters. So a lot of times when we think of them writing letters, we just think of Paul, like, under the Holy Spirit, just, you know, writing a letter. But that's not, he had, he had a whole group of people around him advising him, brainstorming, what are we going to put, how are we going to say it, what's the best way to, to get this church to understand. And uh, so there was a lot of people that were around him while they were writing. And this makes sense because it was really expensive, right, to, to do, like, I think, I think it was, like, either one or three working days to have, like, one sheet of paper. 
that's how much of the wage it was to, to afford paper. It was very expensive to have that papyrus. Um, so some of these examples of co-senders are uh, Timothy, Silas, uh, Sosthenes is mentioned as well. Um, he also used trusted friends to deliver his letters. So um, the postal system in the first century probably doesn't surprise you, but it was really just ref reserved for official government use. Wealthy citizens used it, but usually they had slaves or employees that carried the letters. But for the average citizen, like Paul, uh, they depended on people who just happened to be going in that direction, right? Hey, you're my friend. You're going in this direction. I trust you. Take this letter with you and kind of explain it in more detail and stuff like that. So some examples of some of these trusted friends uh, is like a tic Ticacus. I think that's how you say his name. I always say it wrong, but I'm pretty sure that's right. Uh, in Ephesians 6, 21 through 22, he kind of says his name out loud and stuff in that. But um, So yeah, uh, New Testament letters were also intended for Christians and community. So they were, they were meant to be read out loud, which is kind of something we don't do a lot, right? We usually just read, uh, and, but the letters were, were meant for the ear, not the eye. And uh, it was also kind of anticipated that these communities that, that he wrote these letters to, that it would be shared around, right? That, it w that other people would be reading this besides that church. And so why were these letters read out loud? Well, like we mentioned just a little bit ago, letters were too valuable to loan to individuals. So reading out loud enabled everyone to hear it. Um, They're also kind of accustomed to this, right? Reading scripture out loud, this was kind of a common practice to do. And then lastly, some Christians just couldn't read, right? There was a lot of uh, pretty big portion of illiterate people back then. And so reading the scriptures out loud was a way in which everybody could hear what the apostle was trying to say. And we get a glimpse of this in Revelation uh, where a blessing is pronounced on the person who reads out loud the words of the prophecy into the listening congregation. That's Revelations 1-3. So some other examples where the author clearly refers to this practice is in, for your own just records, is in Colossians 4.15, 1 Thessalonians 5.27, and 2 Thessalonians 2.15. Okay, so let's get into what, what, is, the, what is in these letters, like what's the, the, the format for them. So all the letters start out with an introduction, right? And in the introduction, you'll usually see the name of the writer, the name of the recipi recip recipients, greetings, and an uh, introductory prayer. So introductions are important when you're looking at the letter. Just make sure, because uh, sometimes there are some really, really key components in the conclusion and the introduction. Uh, so for, for example, since Paul's apostleship is being called into question in, in Galatia, he begins the letter to the Galatians by emphasizing that his apostleship has divine origin. Also, if you notice in Galatians, he lacks the term that he usually uses, which is like saints or dear beloved. So this shows us that just from the introduction that the, the tone of this letter is serious, right? It's not, uh, it's not all mushy-gushy, right? <laughs> and then when writing to the Philippian Christians who are struggling with disunity, Paul does something interesting in the, in the introduction. He doesn't call himself an apostle, but instead a servant. So perhaps Paul's trying right here in the introduction, we can see, to teach the Philippians from the start that they need humility to be a servant in order to preserve unity. James doesn't say anything about being the half-brother uh, of Jesus, which he probably was, but instead describes himself as a servant of God, of the Lord Jesus Christ. So you think, you know, James, hey, it's me, brother of Jesus. Maybe you heard of him. You know, you think he'd put that in the introduction, right? But he doesn't. And there's a reason for that. It's because he wants to stress that his authority comes from, uh, from his spiritual, not physical relationship with Jesus. Uh, James also writes to, the, in the introduction, 12 tribes scattered among the nations. So right there in the introduction, we have an indication that he's probably writing to Jewish Christians who have been dispersed because of persecution. So the last component of that introduction is a prayer. Now, it was kind of common for, like, other religions to usually, in an introduction of a letter, give, like, a, a, a prayer to their gods or whatever. And so Paul kind of did the same thing with that. But here's an example of some inter, uh, introductions that we see. Uh, here is one in Philippians 1.1. 1, 1. So that purpose of the introductory prayer was to give gratitude for all that God has done in the life of the, of the church and then he also kind of introduces important themes that are going to be later developed in the letter. So after you get past the introduction, you know, shake yourself, you got to stay awake, <laughs> is the body, okay, right? So the, the body is, uh, there's no set format for this portion of the letter. Uh, it's, it addresses the specific needs of each church. So within the body of the letter, you'll find instructions on, you'll find instruction, persuasion, rebuke, exhortation, you know, this is kind of where you'll find those things. Then you'll have the conclusion, 
And there's a lot of elements that can happen here in the conclusion, but typically it's a grace benediction. But some other examples in these New Testament letters of conclusions would be uh, travel plans, such as in Titus and Philemon, or Philemon, Philemon, uh, at least I'm not saying Philemon, right? Uh, prayers in Second Thessalonians and Hebrews, greetings, Holy kiss is even in First Thessalonians and First Peter. We won't get into that. Uh, autograph, benediction, uh, doxology. These are, these are things you'll find in the conclusion. So here, before we get into kind of how we interpret New Testament letters, here's a few guidelines I want to give you guys. So one, find out as much about the situation behind the writing of the letter. That's going to be crucial, right? Um, discern the major parts of the letter. So what's, what are the big, the most important parts of this letter? What, what's screaming out of this letter to me when you're reading? Uh, look for conventional elements that the letter writer included or left out. That can be very important. Determine the structure, the argument of the epistle. So why is he writing this letter? What's, what's going on here? What's his point? And then make sure you interpret each passage in that letter in light of the whole purpose of the letter, right? Kind of like whenever you're thinking of, if you're interpreting out of the Old Testament and you find a, you kind of want to think, well, why is he writing this in this whole book? You know, that's important. So, and then also, uh, seek to discern what is purely occasional and what is normative principles that can be drawn out. So what is in this text is just like situational, right? To a specific church at a specific time, and what is something that is, can be applied to all churches of all times of all periods, right? That is so important when you're looking at New Testament letters. You have to be able to figure out what, when Paul's writing this, you know, is, are men only supposed to have short hair, or short hair for that time period because it meant something specific to that culture, or, you know, can... Am I supposed? To, am I okay? You know, like, 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 what? Are, what is situational and what is universal for all churches everywhere? So, when you're dealing with a problem passage, uh, here's some some guidelines for that. Um, typically, the reasons for the problems when we have problem passages is because we're reading the letter like it was written to us, and that's that's obviously like we've covered before. That's not the, the route you want to go. So another thing that you can do is learn to ask what can be said for certain about a passage and what is and what is merely possible but not certain. So kind of define what is way out there. There's no way this means this. What could this mean? What does this probably mean? That'll help you out as well. Um, narrow those options down. Even if you can't have full certainty of the details, the point is still often, even if all those things don't be scared off, uh, we can almost always still grasp the main point. And then consult a good commentary or Bible atlas, things like that. So let's go ahead and apply that five-step method that we've been learning, the interpretive journey, two New Testament letters to show you how you can do this with this five-step method. So remember, step one is grasp the text in their town. So the two kind of things you're going to want to do with letters specifically when you're grasping the text in their town is you want to read the letter in one sitting, right? Because that's how the audience would have heard it. They wouldn't have heard just one little paragraph of the letter. They would have heard the whole thing beginning to end read out loud to them. And so maybe read it out loud as well would be helpful. And then two, reconstruct the historical context. So that may so seem easy, like, okay, cool, I, need to, I know I need to do that. How do I do that, right? <laughs> well, here's how you can do that. Asking these series of questions should really give you a strong historical context. So ask yourself, you know, the who, what, why, where questions, right? Who was the author? What was his background? When did he write? What was the nature of his ministry? What kind of relationship did he have with the audience? Why was he write, writing? Who was the biblical audience? What were their circumstances? How was their relationship with God? What about their relationship to the author and each other? What was happening at the time the book was written? This thing just died again. There we go. And are there any historical or cultural factors that might shed light on the book? So if there's something going on like with an emperor or something or taxes, that might help un you understand what's going on in that passage. So after you've done that, after you've read the letter, you've reconstructed the historical context, we're now going to identify the literary context we covered last week, right? That's just a fancy word for meaning what genre are we in so we can play by those rules and what's the surrounding context, right? That's, that's the next step. So this is where you read the text carefully, you observe, you do word studies, all of that type of stuff. And the goal of you doing this is, you're, remember, you're trying to make a summary uh, in one to two sentences of what this text meant to the audience back then. And it's really helpful to put this in past tense so you remember that you know, this, is, this is for the biblical audience, not for me. Uh, and one to two sentences. So uh, once you've done that, you've kind of grasped the text in their town. That should help you. Step two is we're now going to move to that river crossing, right? Uh, and generally when we're looking at the New Testament, the, the river's pretty s narrow. Not like the Old Testament. The river's usually really wide. Um, so, and this is because it was written to New Testament Christians and not Old Testament people of Israel. 
However, sometimes it can be ri- wide, right? Like when we're reading about Paul talking about don't eat meat uh, sacrificed, that's been sacrificed to idols, right, in Corinthians. Uh, that's not something we're really familiar with. So the river's a little wider at that point. So um, although it typically is like a narrow creek, easier for us to cross, it can be a little wide sometimes. So not too much to do there. So step three. Okay, cross the principalizing bridge, the universal truth. That's what we're looking for, right? What, what can we pull out of this that applies to all Christians everywhere of all time period? So um, here we're looking for that, uh, that theological principle. So remember, even though God gives us specific expressions of meaning to the biblical audience, he also sends a broader message that can apply to all people. So this is going to be one to two sentences again when we're trying to find this theological principle. And there can be multiple ones in the text, although sometimes there's, there's usually only one. And this is the one that you're going to write in present tense, right? Because this applies to everyone. It's not like just the biblical audience. So an example of, uh, of some of these things that can help you do this is, does the author state the principle? So often the New Testament authors will state the principle, and the conclusion or introduction is a good place to find that. Such as in uh, Ephesians 6.1, uh, he's, Paul says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord. Right there, he's given us the principle. We don't even have to work for it, right? So be, be aware of when the author states it himself, because sometimes he'll do that. Uh, does the broader context reveal a theological principle? So make sure you look at the context. Uh, and then also, why was the particular command or instruction given? So sometimes when you locate the reason behind a command or instruction, you will also find the theological principle. So for instance, in Galatians 5.2, Paul writes, I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourself be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to, to you at all. When we ask that the apostle, why we when we ask why the apostle warns the Galatians against circumstance or circumstance circumcision, we find the theological principle, which is that people cannot achieve God's acceptance by keeping the law or by human effort alone, which is symbolized by circumcision. God's grace is a gift. So sometimes just asking why is Paul giving this command that can lead us to the answer. Also, I know it's all review, but I know it's not as fresh as it is for me as it is for you, but remember the five criteria for a strong theological principle, right? We gave you five strong things that you can look, if you're trying to figure out what is this theological principle and you're not sure, check it through these five little things, and this will make sure, this will weed out if you have a weak one. So in those five things, just to recap, is the principle should be in the biblical text, right? If you can't find it in the text, you're probably wrong. The principle should be timeless and not tied to a specific situation, The principle should not be culturally bound, so it can't just apply to the Greeks or to the Hebrews or something like that. This principle should be consistent with the rest of Scripture. It shouldn't violate anything that we see in the rest of Scripture. And the principle should be relevant both to the audience and to us, because remember, this principle is for everyone. So this leads us to step four, which is an easy step, typically. uh, Consult the biblical map. Does this, now that we find that theological principle, does that fit with the rest of Scripture? If it does, we're good to go. We can move on to step five. And last step, this is just like the application, right? How do we take this meaning that was once given to them? How do we find that universal truth? And then that universal truth, how do we find an application for it in our world, right? And so I didn't really give you this last time. uh, So you might want to write this down because I don't have a slide for it. I think it got deleted. But there are three steps that can help you when you're trying to figure out the application. And uh, it's really actually quite, it's easier than you think to find the application. Uh, It just, all the wording kind of makes it seem a little hard sometimes. But here are the three steps to helping you kind of find the theological application. So one, observe how the theological principle addresses their original situation and identify the key elements. So your first step is identify what are the key elements that can't be removed. Then once you have of that theological principle. So once you have that theological principle, look at the key elements of it. What can you can, can and can't remove from it? After you find those key elements, now try to find a contemporary situation that contains all those key elements. So try to find a, a situation in our world that has all those same key elements. And then the last step, step three, is to make our application specific by creating a real-world scenario. So if this is all a lot of talk, we're going to do some examples, don't worry. But again, those are just three steps to help you find that, that application to grasp the text in your town. So remember, find the key elements, find a situation in our world that has those key elements, and then make it specific by making a real-world example. So let's do an example of this. I know this is kind of a lot of material, but Hebrews 12, 1 through 2. So if we're reading, this is our passage of study. Let's take this through the five-step interpretive journey for New Testament letters. So let's read. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, 
Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So reading that, you may be like, ah, what do I do? Let's start from the beginning, right? Let's go to the, let's first observe the text. What are some observations that we can make from the text? So some observations that I'm just going to give you that I, right off the bat, you know, we see some interesting terms. We see there's a great cloud of witnesses. Okay, that seems, what's that? What, what are, what's the cloud of witnesses? That'd be a good observation. We see that Paul uses some pretty strong language when he says throw off, right? Throw off, that's a pretty sig- a strong language there. Uh, and then we see he says run with perseverance and fixing our eyes on Jesus. These seem to be some key things that we're, we're observing before we even get into that step one. So now that we've kind of observed the text, noticed some few things, uh, what do we see about this text? It's serious, right? We notice that when we're looking at that Hebrews passage, that it's, it's a serious tone. And he's talking about the cost of discipleship. So that's kind of important to note. Um, and now remember, we're going to do, we're going to try to construct the historical context in step one. So what's the historical context? So what do you guys, uh, what do you guys think is w- about that passage? What are some, uh, some uh, historical elements that are going on in that text. Can you guys think of any? So we're not Jewish converts, right, who live near Rome, uh, but this is uh, the historical context for this, this story. Uh, this is prior to just a period of intense persecution, so, and it's written to encourage these believers to persevere. So we need to take these factors into consideration when we're trying to figure out what does this text mean in their town. And the historical context helps us do that. So when we think about it, this is written in mid-60 AD. This is right before the intense persecution with Emperor Nero. If you guys know about Nero, he was a bad guy, man. I mean, he used to light up his parties. He would crucify Christians, light them on fire, and that would serve as party lighting for his parties. Uh, and he would, he's the same guy that I think was like on a roof playing a fiddle or violin while Rome burned to the ground. You know, guy's nuts, right? So this is the backdrop of which this this text is being written. There is some insane persecution going on right now. Very, very hard. So that's what, that, that's important to consider. After we construct that historical context, remember we move to the literary context now. What does the passage say before and after it? What's the genre? So when we look at the literary context, remember that first verse in Hebrews right there? Look what it starts out with. Therefore, right? And remember we always ask when we see therefore, what's it there for, right? It's alluding to something previous in the text, something important. So we need to go track that down. What is the therefore, therefore? Okay, so that will tell us what's going on before the story. And then we also need to read what's happening after Paul uh, writes this. Well, we see in the following verses, we read the analogy of parental love for a child to explain why believers should embrace hardships as expression of God's love. So we can kind of easily see how this fits in with, with kind of the point the author's trying to make. So to put this all into a sentence... Uh, a summary. Like I said, remember, we're looking for that one to two sentence statement that's going to describe what this text meant to the audience using past tense verbs. This is what we'll get. should be something like this. The author of Hebrews uses the image of a long distance race to challenge his audience to persevere in their commitment to Christ in spite of opposition. So now that we've got this, you know, before we go to that next step of uh, looking at the river, uh, the differences, can you guys think of any differences from the original audience? of that text in Hebrews to ours now? What are some differences to the contemporaries? What are some things different from the biblical audience and our audience today in Hebrews that that maybe we're not struggling with? Okay, yeah, definitely. We are not Jews, right? Uh, We're not, and we're not being tempted to revert back to Judaism, right? Although we may be able to, there are some people who are deconstructing Christianity, right? That's kind of common right now of people doing that. Uh, so maybe some, maybe we, we're not tempted to refer, revert back to Judaism, but we are tempted maybe some Christians to revert back to our previous way of life before we were Christians. Any other differences that you guys can, yeah, Jackson. Yes, we, right, especially here in America, we don't face that same level of persecution, right? Now, I'm not saying that we don't have persecution in our world, but what I'm saying is we don't have an emperor who's lighting Christians on a cross for party lighting, right? It's a very different persecution setting. So yeah, those you guys hit them both, exactly what I had. So that's, those are the differences in the river, right? 
uh, that we need to note before we move on to trying to find that theological principle. Okay, so now that we've done that, ooh, here is a good example of a theological principle for this passage. Uh, the Christian life is a difficult, long-distance race which requires both effort and endurance. So notice, despite our differences, we can take that nugget of truth out of this passage that applies to all Christians of all time, right? Here's another example of a theological principle you might come up with. The saints who have gone before us supply us with the valuable examples of endurance. We should look to them for inspiration and encouragement. It's another little nugget of truth we can take out of that passage, right? Here's the third one. To run the race successfully means we need to reject things in life that hinder our progress, and most importantly, focus on Jesus and our relationship with him. Okay, so now that we've done, now that we've kind of found some theological principles that apply to everyone, uh, we ask ourselves step four. Is it starting to become more routine now, right? You notice as we're learning it, does this fit with the rest of the biblical map? Yes, those principles do. When we look at those principles, that, that nothing in scripture refutes that when we look at the rest. It harmonizes, right? Then we go to our last step, that application step. What does this mean in our town? How do we take this theological, one of these theological statements that we have, like this one, the Christian life is difficult, and how do we make this relevant to our time period? Well, remember those three application method thing I gave you, the three steps. First, identify the key elements. So what are the key elements in this theological principle? Well, the key elements are right here. Runners are Christians, and the race is life itself. The, ra the race is difficult, and we are tempted to take the easier course or quit. Running successfully requires both effort and endurance. So those are those key elements. So now that we have the key elements, we're going to try to think of a contemporary scenario, right? Something how to, that has all these elements still. So if you're trying to think of a parallel situation, you want to make the application as specific as possible. So like, for instance, if we were going to make this uh, passage relevant today, I might use the example or the application of you know, in youth ministry here at WCC, we have students that come from difficult non-Christian home situations, right? They feel guilty or angry about their parents' divorce, or maybe they don't even know their parents. Some have suffered physical or verbal abuse. So my advice, my application in our real-world setting would be that, you know, that these students, they're running that, that race that's difficult, right, to be a Christian. And uh, to be able to run that race faithfully, we need to pray for them and love them and encourage them to endure, we know by experience that running a successful race means choosing Christ even when ridiculed, excluded, or treated unfairly, or popularity, all of these things. So running with endurance means staying with our feet and staying, uh, uh, running with endurance means staying on our feet and fixing our eyes on Christ even when we feel exhausted, depleted, or stressed, or at a breaking point. The race is not a sprint, but a marathon. So uh, that's just kind of an example real quick. Uh, that we could maybe find a real-life scenario that we could apply that, that theological principle to. So to conclude all of this with New Testament letters, uh, you know, life really wouldn't be the same without letters. We use them all the time, and so did the, the New Testament writers. Um, these letters serve as authoritative substitutes for leaders who cannot always minister in person. They are written to address the specific situations and meet practical needs of their readers. The letters were carefully prepared and meant to be read out loud to the congregation again and again. When you approach a New Testament letter, remember that it's a letter, not a telephone book. Letters are meant to be read from beginning to end in the same way you read a personal letter today. We have to take the historical and cultural situation seriously, placing a high priority on tracing the author's flow of thought through the literary context. And then we use that principalizing bridge to cross the river of differences and apply the meaning of the biblical text to our life. So that's kind of, in a nutshell, a very sped up version of how some guidelines and some steps we can apply to New Testament letters to help us kind of crack the meaning. So now with that, let's move on to Gospels. Also, if you didn't get PowerPoints, there are printed out PowerPoints back there on that uh, communion table. Okay, so at the center of our faith stands a person, Jesus Christ. He performed miracles and spoke very, the very words of eternal life. But one thing Jesus didn't do is publish an, uh, an autobiography, right? And without a book from Jesus himself, how do we know anything about him? Well, we certainly have enough information from Jesus from outside sources to prove that he actually existed. But our most direct witnesses to Jesus come from the four 
eyewitness accounts of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. These four books comprise almost half of the New Testament. So we definitely want to know how to interpret these right. Uh, in this chapter, in this uh, yeah, in this chapter of the book, you can expect to learn two things, or today to learn two things, is that first, uh, what are the Gospels? Right, we're going to explain what are they, specifically what kind of story did the Gospels writers intend to tell? Are they like modern biographies? Uh, if so, why do they not tell us about everything about Jesus, right, like his childhood? Um, why do these four books not always have the same chronological sequence? That's something we're going to address as well. So we need to understand as much as possible of the genre of Gospel to, or in order to read it the right way. Once we understand uh, how to, what the Gospels are, we'll move to that approach of how to interpret them. And this is where, uh, this is probably the one genre that I'd say the five-step interpretive journey doesn't apply very well to. I would not use that method, even though it works almost on every other genre. When it comes to Gospels, there's kind of a special set of circumstances to interpret it. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you that method for that today. Uh, like I said, I know it's a lot to learn, but all these genres do have different rules, and we have to learn them to be able to interpret it the right way. So what are the Gospels? Well, the term gospel, translated from the Greek, means euangelion, which means good news. So typically when that word euangelion was used in the ancient world, uh, it had those first, those first two bullet points. That's what it typically meant. So it meant news of a political or military victory, news of the birth of a, uh, of a new emperor. So, um, but the third one is for what it meant in the New Testament period. So even though that word meant something a little bit different maybe in the ancient world, when it was used during the, thir- the first century in the New Testament, it was news proclaimed about or by Jesus. So at the most basic level, Gospels are stories. You know, first and foremost, th- they're stories. And everybody loves a good story, but why? What is so interesting about stories that captures our attention uh, like nothing else does? Stories are interesting, right? We find ourselves entering the story and relating to the characters and this way, we participate in the story. And so that's why we like them, because we get to use our imagination to visualize the story. Um, the Gospels are powerful because they're stories, but what kind of stories are they? Well, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were viewed early on as stories of Jesus drawn from personal experience of the apostles, or as uh, Justin Martyr puts it, memoirs of the apostles. Now, this may sound like the authors were writing biographies of Jesus, but when you read the four Gospels, you start to notice something, that they're somewhat different than modern biographies, Right? Can you guys think of any examples of how the Gospels today are different from modern biographies? Yeah, right? Usually biographies will cover the whole span of their life, so definitely that's one. Uh, anybody else? Can you think of any other differences between ancient biographies and modern biographies? So yeah, so when it comes to uh, the differences between, I mean, Gospels and modern biographies is that like uh, Jeff just said, the Gospels do not cover the whole life of Jesus. The Gospels arrange the events topically rather than chronologically, so they're going to they're gonna put the material in the order that they did for a reason, for a theme or for developing a thought. Not necessarily, they're not doing it to say, this has happened and this happened and this happened to give you a time scale. And then the Gospels also devote a large section to Jesus' death, which typically biographies don't really do that. Uh, we know why that would be the case with Jesus. His death was really important, obviously. So, um, what are some similarities between Gospels and ancient bibliography? Well, even though there are some differences between modern biographies, there the similarities are with ancient biographies is that they begin with birth, they end with death, the st- there's stories and sayings in between that, the, there's a thematic emphasis and a content emphasis rather than it being cr- a chronology, promoting a particular hero, a vindication scene, use of genealogies, etc. These are some of the similarities. Some differences between Gospels and ancient biographies is one, a lack of comprehensive biographical detail. So two, uh, an absence of consistent chronological order t- in the four Gospels, and then the anonymous nature of the Gospels. So although there's differences between what we're used to reading when we, see, when we see a biography, that doesn't mean that they're not biographies. This just means that they're not modern biographies. The genre of Gospel fits ancient biographies just fine. So Here's an example of, if you uh, were to spend some time reading the Gospels, you would notice that while all four essentially tell the same story, the details vary from one Gospel to another, right? What we really have is four different versions of the one story of Jesus. Now, for those of you who are fixated uh, and and just want to start itching a little bit because there's no uh, chronological strictness, 
uh, we can start to get a little stressed out about this. For example, how do we understand Matthew and Luke switching the order of the second and third temptation? Or on a larger scale, you will sometimes find a considerable change in the order of the same events as presented in the first three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So Matthew, Mark, and Luke are generally called the synodic Gospels, which means they, they can be seen easily together. They, they follow kind of the same format, and, and you can compare them, and I encourage you to when you're reading Mark's account of a, of a story of Jesus, make sure you go read the other three, you know, but John, John's a little out there. He does things differently. It's not that John is wrong or that it's just that his focus when John is writing, he, his purpose, he's writing about Christ's deity. He's trying to get his readers to understand Christ's essence as deity, and so he takes a different route. So when you're, when you're looking at these different, there's actually a book out there I'd recommend called The Harmony of the Gospels, and it kind of shows you all four Gospels of every story that they cover and shows you, ki- it's kind of interesting to read because you see sometimes how Mark includes a little bit more detail here than Luke, and, and Luke in- includes a little thing that maybe he noticed that Mark didn't, and so it's kind of, it's very noteworthy to read them both. But this difference in words or order, it shouldn't really concern us because these differences, they're, they're, they're for a reason, and that's to illustrate the different theological purpose of the gospel writer. The gospel writer had their own agenda, and that's why they're arranging this material and and making it different. We'll get into that in just a little bit. But so what we have here is the four gospels are not the result of four people following around Jesus with camcorders and and tape recorders and stuff like that, right? Uh, So what should we make of all this? Well, first consider this. The authors were their own people, uh, right? They had their own background. Like, for instance, Luke was a doctor, so when we read Luke's gospel account, you know what you find in Luke more than any other gospel writer? Stories about sickness and disease and cure, and, and he references Jesus as being a cure. You know, he, he takes that slant. Those stories would have stood out to him more, and he would have remembered them more than Mark, who wasn't a doctor, right? Uh, or uh, when you think of Matthew, Matthew was a Jewish tax collector. So do you know what you find in his gospel more than others? Jewish references and, and, and teachings on money. He includes more teachings about money than any other gospel writer. Um, Mark had a Roman audience, uh, and they were very action-oriented. So, and this is kind of funny, because when you read Mark's gospel, he uses the word and. I think it's either like 1,500 or 2,400 times. And then this happened, and then this happened, and then this happened, right? It's because he's trying to engage that Roman audience who were all about action, you know? And if he didn't do that, then like right now, I'd lose most of you, right? <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, we're kind of accustomed to that a little bit too. And then John, like I said, he's, conser- he's, he's more writing about Christ's deity, so he takes a different stance than the other kind of gospels on certain, the route that he chose to convey the information. So, they couldn't have recorded everything uh, that was in Scripture. Um, and John even admits this, right? Uh, J- or they couldn't have recorded everything of Jesus' life, right? And John says in his last gospel, he says this, or in the last sentence of his gospel, he says, Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. So this is very interesting because a lot of times we think that we have like everything Jesus ever said right there in the books, and we, we just don't, unfortunately. I mean, just think about this. You can read Jesus' longest speeches, aka his, uh, or an example, his uh, Sermon on the Mount, which was known to be really long. We can read that in a matter of minutes right? Even though we knew it took pretty much all day for him to speak, uh, sometimes hours at a time. There simply just wasn't enough time or scroll space to tell the whole story. And so as a result, under the direction of the Spirit, the gospel writers chose what to include and what to admit and, uh, and how to arrange it. So as ancient biographies biographers, the gospel writers felt free to paraphrase or summarize what Jesus said and arrange the events in a particular theme. So Luke admits the, in Luke 1 through 1 through 4, his use of eyewitness testimony and careful research in the retelling of the story of Jesus. The goal of the gospel writer was to tell the story of Jesus in a faithful yet relevant, persuasive manner for the readers. So rather than viewing these differences between the accounts as errors in reporting, we should see them as illustrations of different theological purposes. I know I'm repeating that a lot, but I really need you guys to, to get that, is that we have a lot of attack on Scripture today because, look, there's all these differences. Look at what Luke writes and then Matthew writes. Look at the order. It's wrong. And people don't understand that it's not because they're, they're wrong in their reporting. They have different reasons. They're, they're arranging that material that way. So, for instance, in Matthew's Gospel, the kingdom of God, uh, when we were talking about uh, the second and third temptation of Jesus, and remember I said that Luke and Mark, or Matthew and Luke, had them switched. Well, this makes sense because in Matthew's Gospel, 
uh, is about, he really focuses on the kingdom of God. So it makes sense that Matthew would end his account of the temptations with Jesus seeing the kingdom of, kingdoms of the world, right? When Luke's gospel, Jer- Jerusalem is, is a really important thing. And so you can understand why Luke would switch the order and put Jesus being tempted to jump off the temple in Jerusalem last. So Matthew and Luke vary in the details of telling their story to make a theological point. So even though the gospels are similar to the genre of ancient biography, they really are, the best way to kind of think of gospels is they are Christ-centered biographies. Okay, so let's get into how do we kind of interpret gospels. So these two, these are the two purposes of the gospel writer. Material has been selected and arranged to tell the story of Jesus. And two, through the story of Jesus, they communicate an important message to the first readers. So if we take these two, uh, also if you want to look at the origins of the gospel, you can look at those later. That's just a list of the top five theories of how the gospels came about. Uh, but when we take those two purposes that I just read and turn them into questions, it's, it's better because then we can ask those questions and find the, the purpose of the gospel writer. So instead of, so instead of it, you know, material has been selected and arranged to tell the story of Jesus, turn that into a question. What does this small story tell us about Jesus? And for that other second purpose, uh, turn it into a question so it reads, what is the gospel writer trying to say to the readers by the way he puts the smaller stories together? So this is going to, we're going to be doing this, this is the most important thing to do in the gospel when you're interpreting gospels, is make sure you, one, what is the story saying about Jesus? And then two, why did the author put these stories that were before it and after it, why did he put them in this order? Is he trying, is he stringing these stories together for a reason? And this was something I never knew when I was interpreting scripture. I didn't realize how much of the stories in the gospel are arranged in an order for a reason. And it's because the author's flow of thought, he's building a case, he's building a point. So let's look at some, let's look at an example of that so you guys can get a big picture of kind of what this looks like. Because uh, I know it kind of seems, when you're just reading it, it's kind of hard to understand. But let's look at the story of uh, Mary and Martha in Luke chapter 10, verse 38 through 42. So as Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. So when we're looking at this passage, remember that first interpretive question we're going to ask. What does this story tell us about Jesus? What are, and then we're going to look at the second one. What are the gospel writers saying by the way he connects this story of Mary and Martha and the stories before it and after it? So step one, what is this story telling us about Jesus? So I did kind of the work for you, but to put it in a summary, um, the main takeaway of what the story is telling us about Jesus with Mary and Martha is that here we discover that the principle that doing good things for God can sometimes cause us to miss God himself. Martha's desire to put on a feast for Jesus causes her to miss the best thing, listening to Jesus. So see in the middle part uh, where it says Luke ten thirty eight, that's the summary I just read. So when we look at Mary and Martha, this is what it seems for that first question that it's answering. What does this story tell us about Jesus? Bam, right there. Now remember, before we look at the other stories around it, we need to do the same thing with the previous and the stories after it, right? What does that story mean uh, or teach about Jesus? So when we look at the story before Mary and Martha, what do we see? We have the Good Samaritan. And to put that in like a little summary, this is what the Good Samaritan's about. The Good Samaritan, the main idea is we see that the principle that love for one's neighbor should transcend, transcend all human boundaries, such as nationality, race, religion, or economic status. Now let's look at the, la- the story right after Mary and Martha. What does this say, uh, teach us about Jesus? Well, Jesus teaches us how to communicate with God through prayer. This is followed by a parable in prayer and, and then ends with an exhortation to pray. So now that we've kind of got the main idea for the stories before and after it about what it teaches, we can move to that second step. Why did the author put these in this order? What was he trying to, to prove or say? And this is what's really interesting is you can see uh, some interesting uh, reasons for, and connections for why he did this. So here's kind of one, one, one particular uh, thing, is that the common theme seems to be relationships in these three stories, right? In the first one, uh, the story we are told that followers of Jesus should be loving neighbors to people in need. In our second story, we're taught that listening to Jesus should take priority over religious activity. Finally, Luke emphasizes our relationship to God, right? 
followers of Jesus need to know how to relate to their neighbor's service, how to relate to their Lord devotion, and how to relate to their prayer, or their father prayer. So I can't be 100% that I've captured, you know, Luke's intention here, but I'm trying to show you, uh, you know, don't force anything. Try to stick to the main idea of each passage, and you'll discover some insights as you look at that and why he's connected them in the order that he's done. That was just a big picture idea, just so you can get an idea. But now let's, uh, so when we're reading series of stories, you know, the most important thing to realize is when looking at these stories and what surrounds it uh, is look for connections. That includes common themes, patterns, logical connections, transitions, conjunctions, okay? And then remember, those two questions are, are absolutely important when we're looking at a series of stories. Ask, what does this story tell us about Jesus? And then two, why are they connected in the way that they are? Okay, so now that we've kind of looked at series of stories and Gospels, how do we read an individual story like Mary and Martha? You know, I just gave you an example that I did that, but how, I want to make sure that I teach you guys how to do that with an individual story, right? Because we can't really look at a series of stories if we don't know how to interpret an individual story. And it's not, it's, again, it, these two questions are still going to be very central to that process. So, okay. Um, here, this is numbered so bad, and I'm so sorry. I don't know what happened. It's supposed to be one, two, three, four. I, I'm sorry. But anyway, so when we're reading individual stories, these are, this is the four-step thing that you can do uh, to answer that question, what does this story teach us about Jesus? So it's great to, you know, ask that question, but how do we actually find out what is this story teaching us about Jesus? Well, when we're looking at individual stories, here's the four things you're going to do to kind of help answer that first question. One, ask the standard questions of who, what, when, where, and why, right? Two, look for interpretive instructions from the author himself. So this is important in the intro or the conclusion. Sometimes the author will make some important announcements, so make sure you pay attention to that. Three, which is reading two, (laughs) take special note of anything that's repeated. And then four, be alert for places where the story shifts to di- direct discourse, to where the story shifts to dialogue. So be a, when the story shifts to dialogue, that's, we need to take space, pay special attention to that. Okay, so let's, let's say we're reading an individual story, and we're going to use that four, those four steps on this story. On Mat- Mark 4, 45 through 41, Jesus calms the storm. So let's go ahead and read this, and then we're going to do those four steps to answer that question. What does this small story tell us about Jesus? That day when the evening came, he said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind and wave, or rebuked the wind and said to the waves, quiet, be still. Then the wind died down and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. So if we're going to try to unpack this individual story, let's start with those four steps we just read off uh, on this slide right here. So step one, ask the question that you should ask of any story. The who, what, when, where, why stuff, right? So when we do this, just look at this picture up here. You can see we answer a whole lot, right? Just by doing that, by looking at who, which are the characters, the where, which is the storyline, the when, which is the time, uh, the where, which is the place, the why, which is the reason, and the how, which is the means, we can see, we can make some significant discoveries. We also notice that when we're doing this, that uh, Jesus and his disciples in, in that Mark passage, they appear in almost every verse. So we can be pretty confident that the story is focused on them, right? So now that we've done that who, what, where, why, when stuff, um, step two is we're going to look for interpretive instructions from the author himself. So is there anything in that Mark passage that the author is kind of revealing for us? Uh, So for an example, like if we're doing a different passage, the intro right here, what can we learn from this? Right off the get-go, before we even read about the parable, what does this kind of tease or or help us hint at? Well, uh, when he noticed how the guests picked the places of honor at the table, he told them this parable. So this context, this intro, tells us that this parable, even without reading it, has something to do with spiritual pride and humility, right? When we're looking at the Mark passage, look at the conclusion, that last passage, that last thing that we we read. They were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and waves obey him. So right here we can tell what is the author trying to get us, get across here. I think we can understand that uh, we're left with that, that distinct impression that Mark wants his readers to know that Jesus is something more than your average rabbi, right? That even he possesses divine authority over the power and forces of nature. 
So like I said, sometimes in that step, we can, look for the, we can look to the author for help, and the intro and the conclusion is a good spot for that, as illustrated by these two. Okay, now step three. I don't have this up here, but take note, a special note of anything repeated. There isn't too much repeated in that passage in Mark, but there are a few things that are repeated that uh, you, you'll want to write down and make note of. I unfortunately don't have the slide of what I had done for that, but uh, yeah. And then four, what's the dialogue of this story? When does it shift to dialogue and stuff like that? So anytime you see something in quotes, that's, when it's, that's, what, that's what discourse is. So when we look at our, ma- our uh, Mark passage, what's the dialogue? Well, here is all the dialogue together. And what's really cool is oftentimes when you just take the dialogue of a passage and just put it out there, you can almost see the heart of the story just from the dialogue. You don't even need anything else. Like if you just had this, you can kind of get an idea of what the story is about. That's how important the dialogue is. Okay, so we've done the first step right? You guys are tracking with me still? We've taken that passage, that individual story of Mark, and we've ran it through those four steps, and now we have a pretty confident, we can, we can figure out what, the main, what, what that story meant or what is teaching it about Jesus. So, uh, and we, for individual stories, we, we did that by asking the standard, standard narrative questions, by paying attention to the author's own interpretive instructions, noting what's repeated, concentrating on the dialogue. So after we do that, we can, look, we can go to step two, how does this passage, Mark, fit in with the stories around it? And you'll, if we look at that, you'll find something really interesting. So again, I did the work for you here on this one, or the book did. So here are the, st- here are the stories that come right after that Mark passage. So the first one is, is, is that, what did that story teach about Jesus? Well, Jesus exerts his power over the sea and responds with faith during a diff- difficult circumstance. Okay, so now let's look at the next passage. What was that, that passage Uh, teaching about Jesus. Well, in Mark 5, right after, Jesus cast out a legion of demons, restores a man to his right mind, and sends him out as a faithful follower. If we look at the passage right after that one, Mark is, uh, 524 is, Jesus heals a woman with a hemorrhage who, because of faith, touched him and then confessed him publicly. And then right after that one, we have, Jesus raises the daughter of Jairus from the dead in the presence of Peter, James, John, and the girl's parents. So, what are, what's the connection here? Why is Mark arranging this material, these series of stories, in this order? Well, here's kind of like, uh, this is going to help us form that theological principle, which is this. Through his mighty works, Jesus shows himself sovereign over the forces that are hostile to God. Demons, disease, death strike fear and hopelessness into the heart of people. But Mark's first century readers were facing persecution and hostility. Through this series of stories, he assures them that Jesus has power over everything they fear. He can calm the sea, he can cast out demons, he can heal diseases, and he can even raise people from the dead. They should trust him in the midst of desperate situations. So do you see, isn't that cool how, how, that, how those stories right there all are talking about Jesus' power to overcome all of these things that we're terrified about, whether that's waves and wind and storms, whether that's casting out a legion of demons and demonic activity and stuff, whether that's healing these diseases that no one knew how to heal, or whether that's the last one, raising people even from the dead, Jesus has got our back, right? He's got power over those things. So you can see just by taking these two steps, one, seeing what each passage talks is teaching about Jesus, and then how, seeing how they fit together, we can kind of locate that theological principle. What's also interesting is that if you look, if you fast forward uh, to Mark 6, the, the next story after this, what is it about? Well, Jesus goes back to his hometown, and he faces rejection, right? And they test him. They say, isn't this uh, the carpenter, they ask? And then Mark's closing statement, he says, he could not do any miracles there except lay his hands on a few people and heal them. He was amazed at their lack of faith. So this last story is a contrast, right? Because the last story, I mean, think about what a hopeless message that is and a sad contrast that is to the hopeful message of the four stories before it, right? Here we have Jesus conquering all these things and having power over all these things and yet then the next story is he goes to his hometown and there was no belief and he could could only do a few things. You know, I just think it's an interesting contrast. Okay, so now we go to how do we apply this? Okay, so when it comes to gospels, you have to keep the larger context in view. Uh, This will help you from kind of coming up with an application that's too simple. For, for, instance, uh, for example, if we were going to cover that Mark passage, if, if we had this as our theological principle. Where is it? There it is. So if that was our theological principle right there, and I was trying to make an application, 
it would be really wrong of me to say, well, because of the story, I don't have to, you know, I can, Jesus is always going to heal me. Every disease I get, every time I die, I'm just going to be back from the grave, you know. That would be a too simple of an application to make, right? Because I'm not taking the whole context into important. Because in this story, Jesus didn't heal every person in the world, right? Even the people that he raised from the dead, they eventually had to die again, right? And so uh, it's important to look at that larger scope before we make that application, Um, saying that Jesus has power over hostile forces does not guarantee that he will always deliver us from cancer or car wrecks or other disasters. We should trust Jesus in the midst of desperate situations in life, but the rest of scripture and all of history make it clear that his deliverance can take different forms. Sometimes he delivers us from immediate danger by prevention or healing. Other times he delivers us from an ultimate danger by the resurrection of the dead. So when Paul says in 2 Timothy 4.18, the Lord will rescue me from every attack and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom, He's obviously not speaking about, he's talking about his, he's obviously talking about his ultimate and final deliverance, right? He's not talking about uh, in his life here on earth that God's going to do that because we know he died as a martyr, right? So uh, a legitimate application of Mark 4 and 5 would be, you know, something that has all those same key elements and everything would be uh, when they were writing this book, actually, uh, there was a plane of, of, of the authors uh, were professors at this university and they were, this university was going on a mission trip, and the plane crashed, and a professor and one of the students died. And so uh, how, would, how would we apply Mark 4 and 5 to this, this scenario? Well, uh, remember that uh, the theological principles we had established from that story. One, life is hard. B, Jesus is sovereign over forces hostile to God. And C, we should trust Jesus in desperate situations. So to apply this, uh, you know, the first one's easy. Life is hard. Christians should not expect to be exempt from difficult situations such as plane crashes, disease, or death. Uh, Two is a little bit more difficult to apply. You know, if Jesus calmed the storm for his disciples, why didn't he calm the storm for for the people on the plane? Again, we return to the larger context, you know, that God doesn't protect and heal everyone in this earth. Uh, The first readers of Mark's gospel were facing intense persecution after all, right? But in an ultimate sense, we can look towards hope knowing that Jesus' miracles are previews of what is to come, glimpses of what life will look like when he returns. So the message of the entire New Testament is clear for those who have a relationship with God through Jesus. In time, there will be no death, mourning, or pain, uh, so we can look forward to that. So that would be like a fair application. Is even though we have th- these terrible circumstances that happen all over our, uh, all, all these different things that seem out of our control, we know that in the end, our ultimate deliverance is in the one who can control, has mastery over all of these things. Right. Sure. Yeah, that's that's definitely a perspective you can have. Yeah. Um, so you know, like for instance, when we're applying that Luke story of Mary and Martha. Um, you know, a good application of this would be, or, or the Good Samaritan would be, is that our love for one, for one's neighbor should transcend all human barriers. But yet, if we're looking for an application, well, just think on college campuses. There are outcasts, right, on, even on college campuses, uh, Bible college campuses, right? Whether it's people judging people because of their appearance, their race, their economic status, their intelligence, their social skills. But if we're going to apply that story of the Good Samaritan to that scenario, then that means that as Christians, look, we have to befriend people who maybe don't look like us or, or tutor a struggling classmate or reach out to international students or, or forgive an obnoxious roommate, right? So Jesus teaches us in that story that not even religious excuses are acceptable when we refuse to love our neighbor. In the story of Mary and Martha, we discover that the principle that doing good things for God can sometimes cause us to miss God. So what's an application of this one? Well, that's not too hard to see. Consider these questions. Do we take time to listen to the Lord on a regular basis? Are we obsessed with religious activity to such an extent that our relationship with God is drying up? Have we learned how to say no to some good things in order to say yes to God's best? Jesus desires our fellowship, and that takes time. Okay, so that's just some examples of of applications. But to summarize all of this, to kind of wrap up, is uh, we've learned that we should read the Gospels in a way that matches the genre of how they were written. The evangelists wrote, one, to tell individual stories about Jesus, and two, they arrange the material in a specific order to get a point across. 
And uh, that's kind of the two interpretive questions we have to keep in mind as we're reading the Gospels. So next week, what we'll look at is we're going to look at some special considerations in the Gospels, some special things. Uh, we'll, we'll continue this PowerPoint next week. Uh, it, it, this one was a little long, so I didn't want to go too, too much farther. But we're going to look at stuff like exaggeration, uh, when Jesus was teaching, and certain things like that. So, uh, and then we'll go, we're going to end with Revelation. Uh, and again, this isn't going to be like, don't expect to come in to next week and think, I know exactly how to interpret Revelation. This is more going to be like a guideline of how to avoid mistakes that people often make with Revelation. And, and you know, one of the things I always tell people is when we're talking about Revelation, come with an extra dose of humility because <laughs> you need it when you're interpreting Revelation. So with that, do we have any questions before we close out? That was a lot of material, wasn't it? <laughs> so again, that interpretive journey that covers a lot of the other genres with Gospels, we kind of covered a different way to do that. So just, I wanted to make that note. But next week, we'll look at that same interpretive journey method on Revelation. It does work on Revelation, surprisingly. Okay, well, let's pray us out then real quick. Heavenly Father, our Lord, we just lift up uh, this time. Lord, I just pray that uh, we can be encouraged to keep going. This stuff is not easy. It's not necessarily fun to learn, but it is so foundational. It's so important. We want to handle your word effectively. And, and Lord, I just pray that when we come to these different genres, we don't just let pride take over, where we just want to take a feels-right approach or, or be lazy in our regard of interpreting. Lord, I pray that we can dig in deep, that you're speaking here, and we want to make sure that we're handling that right. Lord, continue with us as, as we, uh, this is not just a four-week study, but this is something we have to do in our lifestyle, Lord. And I pray that we get better with our swordsmanship. In your son's name we pray these things. Amen.